Today we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew. And as we got into chapter 5, I was mentioning to you that chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 are actually a continuous sermon by the Lord Jesus Christ that has been called the Sermon on the Mount. I mentioned to you that in every sermon there's an introduction, and Matthew 5 is the introduction to that, especially the first several verses that are called the Beatitudes. The word beatitude means blessings, and the Lord Jesus Christ is pronouncing blessings on individuals in chapter 5, especially the first 12 verses. And so as we've been looking at this, he is actually pronouncing eight blessings on those who are his followers, and the blessings that he is pronouncing can actually be divided into two sets of four. Now, the last four beatitudes correspond with the first four. And each of the first four blessings are related to inner drives and and motives, but the next four blessings would be fruit or outworkings that correspond to the first four. And so as you look at Jesus saying, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, well, the corresponding response would be that that person who is poor in spirit will readily show mercy. Those who mourn over sin against God, well, that produces a purity of heart. We'll see next time we're together that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will not hide from persecution. So today, we're going to see how that those who are meek will be quick to seek peace because humility leads to a desire to live at peace. So as we introduce this, I'm going to give you a prolonged introduction. I'm going to develop a foundation so that we can get an understanding of what Jesus is saying when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We need to begin at the foundation, at the basic. We need to remember something that is very obvious, and that is this. Man is not naturally in a constant state of peace. Man is not in a state of peace. The Bible reveals very clearly that man, by nature, is in a state of constant warfare, constant hostility, and that's because we are born with a sin nature and therefore are prone to sin. Now, there are those who would argue that man does not have a sin nature. And these are people who usually don't have any children. (laughs) You know, we can argue from our ivory tower and say that men are born good. And there are many who do that, and there are religious beliefs that man is born a blank slate, and what he becomes is simply that which has been written on that that blank slate. But the fact is, the Bible does not teach that. There are those who would say that man is not a sinner by nature, but becomes a sinner when he actually or she actually uh, has uh, sinned. So we become a sinner when we sin. But the the theological truth is that that's not the case at all. The truth is, is I don't become a sinner when I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner by nature. Uh, According to Psalm 51, verse 5, King David said it this way. He says, I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. So that is what is called the Adamic nature. We receive from from Adam his nature, a nature that has been corrupted by sin. And so we receive that from him. So by nature, we are sinners. We sin because we are sinners. Somebody said the decisive seat of evil is not in social and political institutions, but simply in the weakness and imperfection of the human soul itself. Because we're born with the sin nature, then our natural condition is a state of constant conflict. We are in a constant state of hostility. We are in a state of hostile opposition and war, first with God. We actually fight God. Romans 8, 7 says the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. By nature, we have an opposing spirit. If God says something is sweet, we say it's sour. If he says it's black, we say it's white. If he says it's up, we say it's down. So there is a constant opposition, a constant hostility towards God. And it's part of our sin nature. It's because of our sin nature. In 1 John 1, verse 8, uh, John said, If we say we have no sin... We are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. And there are people who will say, well, I have no sin nature. There are those who say, I don't sin. You know, there was a song when I first got saved, uh, 
uh, where one of the lines of the song was, uh, uh, never been a sinner, I never sin. I've got a friend in Jesus. And that is nonsense. He was lying when he was saying that. So he became a sinner when he sang that. Because we sin. That's the way it is. We have a, a sin nature and we're in hostile opposition to God. So not only are we in hostile opposition to God constantly, but we are also at war within ourselves. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul said it like this. He said, I know I am rotten through and through, so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. I have something within me, a war within my nature. It's, 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 it's a sin nature that, that is in constant rebellion. And man, before they come to faith in Christ, are in constant hostile opposition to God. They have a sin nature that is in constant opposition to authority. And that's the truth. If, if the speed limit is 55, we say, well, we have a five mile per hour grace on that. If the sign says stop, we, we think it really means slow down and look around. It's kind of a suggestion, not a law. It, it's a sin nature that we possess. And, and, uh, and I still remember I was in London back in 1975 and uh, we were looking at a palace, I believe it was Buckingham Palace, and as we were walking, there was a, a patch of grass, and on the patch of grass was a sign, and the sign said, stay off the grass. I have a picture somewhere of me laying on the grass, <laughs> holding onto the sign, because I shouldn't have told you that, right? Now you won't trust anything else I have to say this morning, but we have this thing within us that says, you say no, I say yes. And so it's just a fact. We know that, one, we're in hostile opposition to God. Two, we are within constantly in hostile opposition because we have a sin nature that wars against doing what is right. And then three, we have conflict with other men. We are in opposition to other people. Now, James made this observation through the form of a question when he said in James chapter 4, verse 1, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it the whole army of evil desires at war within you? What is it that causes wars? In context, James would be speaking of church wars, but what is it in general that causes conflict amongst men? He says, isn't it the passions that war within yourself? Isn't it something that even amongst yourselves you can't get along and you're constantly at hostile opposition to one another? And so this nature that we have, this nature that before we're born again is totally given over to just satisfying itself produces conflict. It produces conflict in daily life. It can actually lead to actual physical combat or wars within the world. The great enemy of peace. The great enemy of peace is not financial. It's not educational. It's not societal. The great enemy of peace is sin. Sin separates, separates men from God, and sin produces chaos in our life. And sin itself will eliminate peace. That's why Isaiah 48, 22 would say, there's no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. So when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the sin question is answered. And we can be restored to fellowship with God. That fellowship had been broken by sin. But now, because Jesus died on a cross, with one hand, he holds his father's hand, we'll say, and on the other, he holds ours, and he brings us together through himself. We come to God through Jesus Christ. And the way I can have fellowship and, and cease having hostility is when I give my faith to Christ, receive the message of reconciliation in the gospel, and make my peace with God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Peter was writing and he said, who, speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So Jesus died on the cross. He satisfied his Father's righteous demands and his wrath simultaneously. Now, there are many today who don't like the idea that Jesus should die on a cross as an offering on their behalf. They would like to believe that they somehow can have a relationship with God just by doing the best that they can, being the best person that they are. For them, the cross is really what we would call a stumbling block. 
But the idea of of the cross being an offense isn't something new. It's actually something we find in Scripture. It's even described in such a way. In 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, God's way seems foolish to the Jews because they want a sign from heaven to prove it is true. And it is foolish to the Greeks because they believe only what agrees with their own wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. So in reality, the death on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what is called central to our faith. We cannot be believers in Christ if we do not believe that he died on that cross and he was resurrected. Yet there are those who say that they can have a relationship with God without Jesus Christ, but the Bible differs. The Bible says, no, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And so that's Christianity, and that's what causes people to be so offended by by you and for me to believe that because they think, oh, no, all roads lead to God. You Christians have your own path, but there are other paths that go to God. And the fact is, is they all ultimately lead before God, to be before God, but some are coming to judgment and others are entering into the kingdom. And the way that you enter into the kingdom is through faith in Christ. In early Christian history, perhaps around the second century, there was a creed that was recited that basically itemized our faith. There are creedal statements. There's there's statements of faith. They're they're put together in a form that you can actually memorize. Call them creeds, and they're they're doctrinal statements. Uh, They were used for argumentation with those who didn't believe in God. The, The pagans that were in great opposition to Christianity would actually formulate arguments against the faith of Christ. And so what happened early in the history of the church is, is uh, what would be called the, the church fathers put together creedal statements, belief statements. This is what we most surely believe. These are the essentials of the Christian faith. And uh, perhaps around the second century, there was a creed that was recited and was uh, originally developed to refute early heresy and, and deviations from orthodox Christian teaching. It was called the Apostles' Creed. Now, I'm out of curiosity, I, I've been asking the services today, how many of you have heard of the Apostles' Creed? I'd, I'd like to see your hand. See, some of you haven't, haven't heard of it. The Apostles' Creed was something I learned uh, by heart when I was around seven or eight years old. And it's basically an itemization of our faith, and it's encapsulated in a statement called the Apostles' Creed. And it goes like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so that was a statement that basically was clarifying all that we as believers believe in terms of the essentials. Because what you would do is you would begin that creed by saying, I, speaking of you as a created person, believe, speaking of your faith, in God who you deposit your faith in, and that's how it would work. And you could actually break it down to a whole argument. He's the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, etc. And that's what we would most surely state, and that's what we would believe. We believe that Jesus Christ was crucified. We believe that he died. We believe that he was buried. But we also believe that he rose from the dead. So he died on the cross, was buried, but resurrected. That is essential to Christian faith. But there's a growing number of people who believe that you can have peace without the cross. That brings peace. Somebody once said, people today want to hear about a God without wrath who brings people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. And that's true. You see, it is by the cross that God most beautifully illustrates for us what love really is. Again, we live in a time when the word love has to be defined 
because we use the word love for so many different things. You know, I, I love my dog. I love my cat. I love tacos. I really love tacos. Um, you know, I love driving. I love the mountains. I love the beach. And I love my wife. And I love my kids. And I love my God. So we use the word love to describe so many things that people today uh, don't really understand what it means. And the churches have the responsibility of, of teaching the world what love is. Because God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So love is not a concept theory. It's not a philosophy. It is not an emotion. It is an action on the part of God that causes us to respond to what he has done. God loved me. That's why the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. He showed his love for me. And you can read your scripture and you can find the most clearest description of what love is because God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you're a parent, you have a child. And from a man's perspective, my wife tells me she's carrying my child. And I get all like, wow, we're going to have kids. That's heavy. And so I begin by saying, it's just an idea. I mean, my wife isn't all swollen. I thank God we had nine months to get ready. I mean, what if she told me one day and the next day, oh, here it is. I mean, oh, no, thank you. He gave me nine months to prepare for that event, right? And so from the beginning, I've shared this so many times, I'll say it quickly, from the beginning, when I know that there is life in the womb, and then that life is, is my child, I, I get attached. I got attached very quickly to all of our kids. And, and, uh, and, and I would pat Marie on her little belly as it was swelling with child, and, and I would put my face next to it, and I'd, and I'd yell in her stomach. I'd say, I'd shake her stomach and, and cause Corinne to kind of, you know, move around in there because she used to kick, you know, and I wanted to put my hand and feel the kick and all. That's how I got my kicks. And I used to put my hand on her <laughs> belly, and she would do that. And when she wouldn't kick, then I would shake Marie, and the baby would kind of like get active and kick and all of that. And I used to put my face next to Marie's uh, belly, and I'd yell out, baby, 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 I love you, I love you. And, and that was long before that baby was born. And then the day comes, and then the baby is born. They bring the baby to me. I look at this baby. I say, it can't be mine. It's ugly. I hand it to Marie. <laughs> You know, anybody who says that babies are beautiful, they are theoretically. <laughs> I remember one of my children was born, and they had uh, what we called a cone head. I mean, that baby was kind of like that. And I remember saying to the doctor, I said, uh, will this baby outgrow this head? He said, don't worry about it. It all kinds of rounds out at the end. And it did, thank God, you know. But you look at this baby, and you say, oh, my. And baby can't talk, can't do anything. It just has little cross eyes and little hands that are moving around and feet and all of that and that are just kind of always kicking in. But you love that baby. You wrap it up. You hold that baby. You love that baby. You take it to friends, and they say, oh, beautiful baby. And yes, yes, yes. And you enjoy that baby. The baby grows up. You know, it's a year old, and then goes into two years. And before you know it, the baby's talking to you, saying little sentences. The first word they say is no. You know, you have to do No, you have to no. And they never stop saying that, by the way. They get that from their mom. But <laughs> what goes on is eventually that baby, some babies, not all, but that baby may get mad at you. And that baby may say to you, you don't love me. You've never loved me. If you loved me, you'd buy me that car <laughs> or whatever. And you smile at them if you can. Depends how mad they're making you. But And you say, oh, no, no, that's where you're wrong. When you say, I never loved you, that's where you're wrong. You see, when you were in your mama's womb, before you were even aware of your own existence, I loved you. When you were born and they handed you to me and I rocked you for the first time, I loved you. 
And when you started to walk, and you would walk to me, and I would reach my hands out to you, and you would take your hands off the, the coffee table, and I would shake those keys, and you wanted the keys, and you took your steps. You were walking towards me. I loved you. When I dropped you off at school, when you were five years old for your first day of kindergarten, you cried because you didn't want to go. You wanted daddy. I loved you. When you went to school, to junior high and high school, I loved you. I don't like you right now, but I did love you. <laughs> See, so you've never been able to say to me that I didn't love you. There's never been a day in your life that I didn't love you. Every moment that I've known you've existed, I loved you. And by the way, if you ever say you love me, it's because I loved you first. And yet we do to the Lord. We say, you don't love me. And God says, oh, no, no, no. I have loved you before you even knew I was in existence. I have loved you. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What else can he do to show you how much he loves you? My daughter Corinne was a year and a half, two years old, and she was telling me one day, I love you, Daddy. And I said, oh, no, you don't. And she said, oh, I do, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. I said, no, you don't. I love you. How much do you love me? She says, I love you this much. And she stretched her little arms. I love you this much. And I looked at her and I said, that's not very much. That's not much at all. And I have a picture of her somewhere where she's stretching his, her arms as far as she can. And she's got a real strained look on her face. Because I said, how much do you love Daddy? And bang, you took the picture. That's before we had phones that you could do that with. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me through a plaque my mom gave to me. And the plaque was for Christmas. And it simply said, I asked God, how much do you love me? And he said, this much. And he went to the cross and he died. That's how much God loves you. God loves you. And he gave his son so that you might have everlasting life. And love was demonstrated by the cross. Somebody said, the world takes us to a silver screen on which flickering images of passion and romance play. And as we watch, the world says, this is love. God takes us to the foot of a tree on which a naked and bloodied man hangs and says, this is love. And God demonstrated his love towards us and that Christ died for us. And in that death on the cross, he's reconciling God with sinful man. And as we embrace Christ as our Lord and our Savior and say, God, forgive me a sinner, God grants us something we don't have. He gives us peace. He promises that we can have peace with him, and he also promises that we can have a peace that comes from him. You see, when we're reconciled to him through Christ, we are brought to being at peace with him. And peace with God is made possible because of Jesus' death on that cross for us. In Colossians 1, 19 and 20, it says, It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. So at the cross, all of man's sin was carried by and atoned by Jesus Christ. God's righteousness confronted man's sin. God won. So how do I receive peace with God? How can I be at peace with him? Well, it comes through a total faith in Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. It, it is not Jesus for a while and then someone else later it is Jesus forever. When I got saved, I didn't say, well, I appreciate what Jesus has to say, and I'll try this for a while, see if it works. But if it doesn't, then I'll try Confucius, or I'll try Muhammad, or I'll try Buddha. I'll try some other guy, some other philosophy. I didn't do that. When I gave my heart to Christ, it was forever. And as a result of that, according to Romans 5, verse 1, uh, we've been justified through faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the war is over. We've been reconciled to God. And now we are at peace with him. No more conflict. The hostility has ceased. He gave us terms of peace in the gospel. 
I embraced the message of the gospel and I was reconciled to God. The hostility has ended and now I'm at peace with him. But also when I come to faith in Christ, I am given a peace that originates with him. This is something that Jesus promised to give to those who followed him. In John 14, 27, Jesus said it like this. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You can't get peace anywhere else outside of God himself. You can have a temporary peace, a cessation of hostility or anxiety. All of us can experience that on a temporary basis. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, when I no longer am at war with God, no longer am I hostile and opposed to him, um, and, and I am at peace, reconciled with him, and now I can have a peace that passes all understanding. I can have a peace in times when, when others may be shaken, but, but I, I trust the Lord, and I know he's in control. Uh, Paul said it like this. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You can be going through the most anxious moment of your life, the most concerning time of your life, and, and, and you realize there's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do to make this better. And you cast your cares on him. You cast your cares on him. Your child isn't doing well. You're concerned. There's nothing you can do. They're in rebellion. You've done the best that you can. You go to the Lord and you say, God, I, I did my best. I raised them to know you. I took them to church, Sunday school. They got involved in, in retreats and conferences and even served you voluntarily. And they go to college and, and they come back saying, you know, I don't need your your Christ, I don't need your faith, I don't need it. I, I've leaned on your testimony all along and I need a testimony of my own. What are you gonna do? And you go to your room and close the door and, and you cry out to God. God, in Jesus' name, I dedicated this baby to you. I raised them the way that you taught me to. You said in your word, if I train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not depart. But, Lord, it seems as if they've walked away from you. It's, he's saying he has God in Jesus' name. And you cast your cares on him. One of the things I've discovered about the Lord is his time is always perfect. And he does his work, sometimes silently. Sometimes you don't see it. But he's at work. He's doing something. He's, he's tying things together. He's moving one chess piece to another, if you will. He's working all things together for the good of those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And you cast your anxieties on him, and you trust him, and he has said that I can. He said that he loves me. He said that he's good to his word. I'm going to hold fast to that. You see, Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Jesus said in John 16.33, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, I can't go to the store and buy $10 of peace, $10 of joy. I'll take $20 of love today. I can't buy that. It's not something I can get. I cannot go and purchase it anywhere. Those are things that come from the Lord. What I do is I ask God, in Jesus' name, teach me to love. In Jesus' name, Lord, fill me with your joy. In Jesus' name, I need to have your peace that passes all understanding because at this moment, I don't comprehend the events that are taking place. And Jesus, on one occasion, in John chapter 13, speaking to his disciples, says, what I am doing you don't understand now, but you will later. And I've discovered something. There's a benefit in having a long life following the Lord, and that is this. His timetable is not mine, but he's always on time. He always does what is right in the right time. What I've learned is these, these things that I'm going through, this too shall pass. This will pass. 
When you're young, you start thinking, oh, no, it's always going to be this way. Speaking to a young woman, she says, I'm in a trial, and when is it going to end? I've been it for three whole weeks. And because you're young, you think that, my goodness, if it doesn't change now, if it doesn't change in five days or ten days or in a month or even a year, then it's never going to change. That's not true. That's not true. It's just when we're young, we think that it has to change now. It, the things have to change right this minute. And if it doesn't change now, it never will change. And that's not true. That's not true at all. You've got time. You go out into the backyard, you plant a tree. You don't go the next day to pick a, an orange from it. It takes time. But it does produce fruit if it's cared for. And when you trust the Lord, he's not on your timetable. He doesn't have to do things when you say. He's not my heavenly bellboy. I don't snap my fingers and God jumps. I don't grab a scripture and quote it and then put it in his face and say, you said, you said, you said, because that's what children do. It's interesting how my kids, when they were small, I'd say, clean your room. Can you clean your room? Yes, Dad, and then they wouldn't do it. Then I'd say, I thought I told you to clean your room. Oh, I forgot. But if I said, we're going to Disneyland, a year before, they'd say, you said what? You said we're going to Disneyland. When did I say that? 321 days ago. I mean, they remember everything. You said, you said, and there are people who do that to the Lord. I don't think you have to remind God of his promises. God keeps them. You simply embrace them and wait on him. And guess what? The Lord is good to his promises, and he keeps you in perfect peace if your mind is anchored on him. He holds you. He takes care of you. He loves you. He will see these things through. It will work out for good because you belong to him. Jesus said, be a good cheer. I have overcome the world, and I trust him in that. So what happens is we have this peace with God and this peace from God, and then we have a desire for others to have peace with God. And so we'll get to the scripture. That was your introduction. Verse 9, <laughs> blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. We become peacemakers. We have peace with God and peace from God, and so we become peacemakers. Again, a peacemaker is somebody who has first made peace with God themselves. A peacemaker is somebody who has personally come to faith in God through Jesus Christ and has been reconciled to Him. Romans 5.10, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So a peacemaker, one, personally comes to faith in him, but two, because they have made peace with him, they will lead others to having peace with God. In other words, they share, they witness, they tell others the gospel of peace that enables them to have peace with God and peace from God. We evangelize. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. When you take this gospel message and you share it, it's basically a plea from God to man, be reconciled, and you become a peacemaker. I walk up to my father. I've been saved three weeks. I have my Bible. My mom and dad are seated there at the kitchen table. I read a portion of scripture. I tell him I don't understand what this means, but I know it's not speaking to me, it's speaking to you. And I say to my dad, you're a good man. You're the best man that I'll ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. I say, daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're going to pray and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. What caused me a brand new Christian, to have the courage and boldness, even some would say the disrespect, to tell my father how much I loved him and didn't want to spend eternity without him. What was it? God had reconciled, I reconciled with God 
God gave me peace with him. I began to understand peace with others. I had peace within, and I wanted my dad and I wanted my mom to have the kind of peace that comes through Jesus Christ. It's evangelism. Calvary Chapel came out of what is called the Jesus Movement. Many of the early, early pastors in Calvary Chapel are evangelists, preaching that gospel of peace. We have been reconciled to God. Christ was in God. Christ, Christ was in us, using us by His Spirit to bring the reconciliation to others through the message. The gospel message is a message of reconciliation. To reconcile simply means to take two warring parties and bring peace. The gospel is what God uses to take man who's at war with God and brings him to peace. Again, Jesus on the cross with one hand holding his father's hand, the other hand reaching for us. And at the cross, we are united in him through faith in Jesus Christ. And so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he has given to us the message of reconciliation, and we say, be reconciled to God. You become an evangelist. And third, you become a bridge builder because you want peace in the church. It grieves your heart when the church is not living in peace with one another. The psalmist in Psalm 133, 1 said it like this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In Ephesians 4, verse 3, Paul, speaking of peacemakers, would say that they endeavored to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's just something about peace. I love it. I love it. And when my kids were growing up and it got loud and it got, got loud in the angry way, I, I, never, I, never, I didn't like that. I didn't like the noise. I didn't like the, the attitude. I didn't like the, the raising of the voices and things. And, and I would come in as a father and I would say, you too need to stop right now. You need to stop. That's enough. No more. Stop it. Because I like peace and all of you do. And in church, it's the same way, guys. There's an interesting story. It's found in the book of Philippians, how that Paul had written this letter, and he was speaking concerning the fact that God had taught him to rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The word joy and rejoice are the main words that he uses throughout the book of Philippians. In four chapters, he continuously uses the word joy and rejoice because he wants people to have the joy of the Lord. And, and at a certain point, uh, he actually brings a word of correction, and it's interesting how that takes place. You need to remember that in the early church history, when Paul would write a letter to a church, the church would receive the letter through somebody who brought it, an emissary, and they would bring it to the pastor, and they'd say, the apostle has written a letter for the church. So that happened in the church of Philippi, and so the pastor of the church of Philippi is given a letter by the apostle Paul, and he calls the church together. They convene in order that he might be able to read this letter to the congregation. So the church gathers together, and the Apostle Paul's letter is read. So the pastor just begins with the introduction. Paul, you know, a call of God or whatever his introduction is, he begins with the letter through its introduction as Paul identifies himself as an apostle, etc., goes through and just is reading to the saints in Philippi and goes on and starts speaking about the various things that Paul is, is writing about. And the church is there like you are right now, just listening. But at a certain point, as the pastor's just reading, and he's not, he's not reading and explaining, he's just reading. And as he gets to a certain point, it's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. And you've got to picture this. The church is together. He says, I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. He calls out these two women in the church by name, Euodia and Syntyche, that had a well-known argument. There was hostility between the two of them. And Paul calls them to task right there, even as the pastor is reading. And he doesn't avoid it. He's reading the letter. And it says, I implore Euodia, I implore Syntyche, be of the same mind in the Lord. That's how valuable unity is in the body of Christ. Why is it so important for us to do that? Well, when the church is divided, the world is not attracted to its message because it's a message of reconciliation. It's a message where man who is at war with God is now reconciled to God. Man who has war within himself is now at peace. Man who is at war with other people is now at peace with other people. And the church is supposed to be that shining 
city on a hill that is known by its good works. So that's why Paul would say, get along with one another. You see, a peacemaker will speak what is true, but that peacemaker will say it with love and is not belligerent. When Paul was speaking again in Ephesians, he said, speak the truth in love. So you speak with, with a love for others so that they might have a relationship with Christ and a relationship with one another. You see, when it says, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. My God wants to, be, wants to have relationship with man. He sent his son so that might happen, so reconciliation could occur. And so Christians will reveal what God is because they have a family resemblance. Christian simply means little Christ or Christ-like. Somebody says, what is, a, what is your Christ like? What is Jesus like? The believer, as they mature in the things of the Lord, may one day be able to say, he's like me, and I'm like him. We have a mark. And I've shared with you this, but this is something kind of new. It's a little twist. Let me share this very briefly. We have a resemblance, a mark of the believer. My daughter, Corinne, well, let me back up. I, as a little boy, I have my mom and my dad. My dad had black hair, blue eyes, dark complexion. My mom had black hair, brown eyes, olive complexion. My brother, Frank, my older brother, black hair, dark complexion. And then me, I had real ruddy hair, real pale skin, blue-green eyes. So when my mom would take me and my older brother Frank someplace, I can still remember people would say, oh, are you babysitting? And they would point to me. And that's when I got to the idea, the idea that I don't belong in this family. When I went to family, we'd go to my grandma's every week, and all my cousins, many cousins would be there. And all of them had black hair and olive complexion, and then there was me. And I, I finally started thinking, there's something wrong here. Something's wrong. I don't look like these people. And so I got it in my head. I was adopted. And so I would talk to my mom, and I would sit on the couch, and I would cry. I literally would cry. I'd say, I'm not yours. I don't belong to you. you I'm just a kid you found on the street corner, and you brought home, and you're raising people. And, and my mom would, oh, she'd patient with me, patient with me, patient. And finally... She would say, you're my baby. And I would say, no, I'm not. And she'd say, yes, you are. I don't look like you. I don't look like dad. I don't look like this family. She would always lift up her blouse. She had a birthmark on her right as well as her left. She had a birthmark right here. She would always lift it up, and she'd say, now lift, lift up your shirt, and I would lift up my shirt. And I have a birthmark right here. And she would say, my birthmark, your birthmark. You belong to me. So I took the mark of the beast. But anyway, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but I had a birth, I have a birthmark right here. So fast forward, Corinne is born. They hand her to me. I unwrap her. I look into her right rib cage. My daughter has this birthmark, my baby's mark. She gives uh, birth to our first grandchild, my Josiah. They hand him to me. I look at his little rib cage. My Josiah has a birthmark. So to me, it's been cool, you know. That's cool. But I didn't know this. I just found out this week. I didn't know this. I have a nine-month-old granddaughter named Zoe. And my daughter, Anna, said, Daddy, have you seen this? I said, soon what? She lifts her little shirt up. And guess what? She's got my mark. Well, guess what? You have your father's mark, too. You have a resemblance to God. Amen. Amen. You do. You do too. And that resemblance is this. God desires people to be saved. That's your Father's heart. It's what you have embraced too. My Father wants people reconciled. I want them reconciled. Like father, like child. Evangelism. Share your faith that they might be reconciled to God. 
We are children of God. And like our Father desires people to have a relationship with Him, we do too. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You see, God loves the world and desires it to be saved. And peacemakers do too. We become sons of God. Somebody said, soldiers of Christ in truth arrayed. A world in ruins needs your aid. A world by sin destroyed and dead. A world for which the Savior bled. His gospel to the lost proclaim. Good news for all in Jesus' name. Let light upon the darkness break that sinners from their death may wake. The peacemaker takes this message of reconciliation. They have been reconciled to God. The turmoil within has ceased and been replaced by the peace of God. They encourage others to have peace with God. They live at peace with others, and they take this message out so that those who yet to know him will have relationship with him. And like Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God.